webinar, which will look at what you need to know when it comes to diet and prostate cancer. I'm Katherine Patterson. I'm part of the Research, Health Promotion, and Survivorship team here at Prostate Cancer Canada, and we'll be moderating tonight's webinar. So we'll just start with a few housekeeping items and ground rules. Oh, um, so if we can just go to the next slide. Great. So the Expert Angle team will attempt to answer as many questions as possible, and the question and answer period will be at the Q&A uh, section at the end of the webinar. Only participants with access to a computer or PC during the webinar will be able to ask questions, and you can do so by typing them into the text box in the, right, or in the control panel. Uh, all attendees are automatically placed on mute, and this allows for the best quality audio. Uh, so I'd like to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Sherry Van Patten. Sherry is a registered dietitian and researcher in oncology nutrition at the BC Cancer Agency in Vancouver. She holds a Bachelor of Applied Science and a Master of Science with majors in nutrition and 20 years of combined clinical and research experience special, specializing in both breast and prostate cancer. Her research in interests and in scientific publications are related to diet, body weight, obesity, exercise, and dietary supplements. Sherry is a regular contributor to patient support groups, webinars, and chat lines, as well as an invited speaker for health professionals to inter interpret the scientific evidence on diet and dietary supplements in men with prostate cancer. Sherry is a co-investigator in collaboration with a multidisciplinary team at the Prostate, Prostate Center in Vancouver that is providing education and support to men and their partners with, within the newly established Prostate Cancer Survivorship Program. She is the author of the popular Nutrition Guide for Men with Prostate Cancer that is distributed to every newly diagnosed man with prostate cancer in the province of BC. So with that said, I'll turn today's, tonight's webinar over to Sherry. Thank you very much, Catherine, and a warm welcome to everyone on the phone lines across Canada. This is also a good time to thank Prostate Cancer Canada for the opportunity to share my information with you and also a thank you to the sponsors. As with any presentation, I would always like to start by just saying I have no conflicts of interest and the content of my presentation has been unrestricted. This presentation is really targeted to men living with prostate cancer and their partners, but I see online some familiar names to me from other health professionals or colleagues but the level of the presentation and content has been geared towards men themselves. Today I'm going to talk about several things. This is a basic outline of my presentation, which will run about 30 to 35 minutes, allowing a lot of time at the end for questions. I'm going to discuss a bit about prostate cancer in Canada, maybe some facts that you might not expect, the relationship with body weight and prostate cancer, the most significant portion of the program will be around highlights from the diet and dietary supplement studies that have been conducted in men with prostate cancer, a mention on bone health, tying it all together with what could be called a prostate cancer diet, and also provide you with some recommended resources. So you may be here for several reasons, but one of them might be, if you can't read the small print, everyone knows food is bad for you, but I don't know what else to eat. Obviously, I don't think that's true, but it's always nice to kick off the evening with a bit of humor. So prostate cancer in Canada in 2013, prostate cancer accounted for one in four, about 25% of all the new cancers diagnosed in Canadian men. You may have heard the statistics of one in seven men will develop prostate cancer in their lifetime, and certainly prostate cancer occurs mainly in older men. While it does occur, it's uncommon before the age of 50. The average age of diagnosis is about 68 years, depending on what source you quote. On the other hand, survival rates for prostate cancer are very high. The five-year survival ratio for Canadians in general diagnosed with cancer is 63%, up from 50% a decade ago. But the ratio of survival is 96% for prostate cancer, whereas only one in 28 men will die compared to the statistics of the number of men who get prostate cancer, and we'll discuss what that means. After a diagnosis of prostate cancer, heart disease and diabetes are common, and their risk also may be increased with the forms of cancer treatment available today. Most notably, I'm thinking about androgen deprivation therapy, sometimes referred to just as hormone therapy. For men with early and curable disease, 
the risk of chronic diseases are actually equally, if not more important, to the long-term health of men living with prostate cancer. And I find that in clinical practice and in the services we deliver, this is an important factor that is overlooked when cancer is diagnosed. And this will be an important theme to the rest of my presentation. Something that you might not expect is that for most men, referring back again to the survival statistics, the diagnosis of prostate cancer will most likely have a small effect on overall life expectancy. We know that the risk of heart disease increases with age, and it is the major cause of death in men with prostate cancer. So that leads me to point to the direction for my presentation is that the most important role that diet and lifestyle factors have is really on the overall health of men. And this is in to improve quality of life and also lower the risk of death related to chronic diseases. Said another way, we could say that living a healthy lifestyle that prevents heart disease or chronic disease can actually prolong life in men with prostate cancer. So just turning the focus away from cancer specifically and more to the global picture of health and specifically heart disease. In case you're thinking that your glass is half empty, there is good news. And the good news is that the same foods or nutrients that actually lower the risk of chronic disease may also benefit the risk of prostate cancer recurrence in terms of lowering it. So what is good for one is good for the other in rather a win-win situation. And this is something that's not always highlighted when you look just singularly at one study related to one nutrient or one food and one disease state. So I'm trying to broaden the focus and give the big picture today. We know that chronic diseases are very interrelated. And using a graphic that I borrowed from the American Institute for Cancer Research, we see these overlapping circles. And this is for type 2 or adult onset diabetes and cancer, but it could also be related to heart disease. And we know that chronic diseases in general share these factors. And some of the major ones are obesity, a lack of activity, insulin resistance associated with overweight and abdominal obesity, inflammation within cells, and generally a poor diet. And these lifestyle factors are key strategies in both preventing and treating chronic disease. And again, these same lifestyle strategies that decrease the risk of chronic disease also benefit prostate cancer. I'm going to look a bit first at body weight in prostate cancer. What should I weigh and why does it matter? Canadians have guidelines for body weight recommendations, and a healthy body weight is defined as a range. That's the most important thing to know. And it's using an index number called the body mass index, or abbreviated BMI. A healthy BMI is between 18.5 and 24.9, and it's calculated using your height and weight in metric so that your kilogram body weight is divided by your height squared. There's also charts and one that I will use today where you can find your own height and weight. But the important factor to stress is that health risks occur when a body mass index is greater than 25 as an index number. Overweight is defined as a body mass index between 25 and just below 30. And the medical definition of obesity is a BMI of 30. And these numbers are used when we look at the science and try and draw relationships between health risk and body weight status. This is the chart I was referring to. And I haven't used metric because most people find that still a little tricky to deal with. So on the left-hand side, if you want to find your height, on the right-hand side, we can see if I chose, for example, a man who was 5'10", a healthy body weight range would be between 130 and 175 pounds. If a, if a man weighed over 180, he would be considered overweight. And if that same man who's 5'10 weighed over 210 pounds, then he would be considered obese. You may notice that for each height, and that's relevant to both men and women, for each height, there is about a 35 to 45 pound weight range that's still considered healthy. And that takes into consideration all the Welcome to GoToWebinar, webinars made easy.
weight around the waistline or a spare tire, some kind called abdominal obesity or a apple shape versus a pear shape when excess weight may be on the hips and thighs. The lowest health risk is associated with a waist circumference or measurement less than 40 inches or 102 centimeters, centimeters for men and 35 inches for women. So both your weight range or your BMI is used along with your waist circumference to ultimately arrive at what your health risk might be. And BMI is over 25 and waist circumference over 40 are true indicators that Sherry, are, yes. sorry to interrupt. Um, something happened with the audio on the last slide. And I'm just wondering if you can go back to that slide and, and finish off. And uh, would it be the chart? Yes. And do you know where I may have left off? I, it was when you were describing the, the, to take into consideration the 30 to 45 pound weight range. OK. Um, okay so fairly thank recently it, it cut out. Yeah, yeah. So for each, great. yes, and thank you for that, Catherine. For each height range, there is about a 35 to 45 pound weight range per each height for men and women. And that would take into consideration the variations, as we know, in bone structure and also just genetic differences and also preferences for weight. But you would still be considered a healthy weight within those parameters. Moving on to the where the weight is carried, and I think this you may have heard this part, is just excess weight around the waistline is also a health risk. We want to avoid abdominal obesity or spare tire, and that men should be aiming for a waist circumference less than 40 inches and women less than 35. So it's important to know both what your body mass index is as well as your waist circumference, because the two together show you that if you have excess weight in the midsection and you're overweight, then you're placing yourself at higher risk for the development of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and some forms of cancer. So another little cartoon, my body is apple-shaped and yours is pear-shaped. How can we be unhealthy if we look like a fruit salad? So why do we care about body weight and prostate cancer? There is a recent review done, a systematic review in 2011, that collected all of the information on body weight and prostate cancer in men diagnosed with the disease. And what they concluded was that higher BMI, or body mass index, raises the risk of prostate cancer recurrence after treatment. And what they did is they divided men into the types of treatment that they had. And in men treated with radical prostatectomy or surgery, a higher BMI was associated with an increased risk of recurrence by 25%. And there were 12 studies that fit this criteria, and nine of them showed what we call a statistically significant higher risk for each five unit increment in BMI. This was also an analysis that was done for men treated with radiation therapy. And similarly, we see an increased risk, in this case, by 15%. There were fewer studies, but three out of five uh, found a statistical relationship. And this included men with hormone therapy and without. And taken together, what it's showing us is that BMI, or body mass index, when it's elevated, is related to poorer outcomes in men diagnosed with prostate cancer. Overall, overweight and obesity are not well linked with the development or getting prostate cancer. However, as we've seen, men with prostate cancer with higher BMIs at the time of treatment can experience an early recurrence when these weights are compared to men in the normal weight range. Another study of the same year found that weight gain after diagnosis, starting after a gain of about 2.2 kilograms or over 5 pounds, was associated with a higher risk of recurrence. There's also the observation that obesity at the time of diagnosis is created, sorry, is associated with a high-grade disease and the development of advanced or fatal prostate cancer. So taken together, this evidence is showing us that there is an important relationship between body mass index and outcomes from prostate cancer. Some of you may also have heard something called metabolic syndrome. It's a name given to sort of a cluster of factors that, when taken together, raise your risk of chronic disease, mostly heart disease, and other problems such as diabetes and stroke. 
The interesting thing is that metabolic syndrome may develop in some men with prostate cancer who are treated with androgen deprivation therapy or hormone therapy. Typically, when we're trying to diagnose metabolic syndrome, it includes any three of the following as a definition. So again, excess weight around the midsection or abdominal obesity, high triglycerides, which are fats in your blood, low good cholesterol, high blood pressure, or high blood sugars. And again, this clustering effect is the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome that is an issue in some men treated with hormone therapy. The bottom line is that body weight is one of few modifiable risk factors that can lower the risk of prostate cancer. Again, it's optimal to maintain that BMI within the healthy weight range. And what's also relevant is to prevent adult weight gain, which we know is very common and also associated with the delivery of some prostate cancer treatments. A safe rate of intentional weight loss is only about one to two pounds per week. The more sensational types of weight loss promoted with some fad diets or programs is much greater, but it runs the risk of dehydration or, more importantly, loss of lean body mass, muscle mass, and bone mass. What's really important to emphasize, if you are overweight and struggling to lose weight or trying to prevent weight gain, we know that from the literature that 5 to 10 percent weight loss actually has very important health benefits, even when ideal weight is not reached. So for example, if you were a man weighing 200 pounds, between 10 and 20 pound weight loss would actually have medically important benefits even if you felt you could not reach the BMI. The bulk of my presentation is going to look at diet and dietary supplements, and I'm going to highlight the conclusions or outcomes from what we call randomized controlled trials that have been conducted in men with prostate cancer. An RCT is the most rigorous method of testing a agent, whether diet or dietary supplement, and it gives us the most trusted results compared to other research designs. So in my presentation, I have prioritized this research in particular to provide my recommendations. If we look at all of the studies, I have identified about 28 RCTs that have used a specific diet or dietary supplement. And all of these studies have been conducted in men with a history of prostate cancer using prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, as a biomarker or indicator of whether or not the cancer is progressing. Most of these studies looked at the following agents, either comprehensive lifestyle interventions, plant-based diets, low-fat or vegan diets, or the inclusion of a diet supplemented with soy. The most popular dietary supplements have by far been soy isoflavones, or plant estrogens, as they're sometimes called, an antioxidant compound called lycopene, vitamin B and D, and also the mineral selenium. Again, I have prioritized the evidence around the highest level of evidence some people call a gold standard that's able to, cause, to establish more effectively cause and effect. Yeah, many years ago, myself and uh, Johan DeBoer and Emma thompson Guns, she, her and I and Johan reviewed the literature, and I'm in the process of doing that again with the additional trials that are available. Starting with the lifestyle intervention studies, there are six in total. And mostly, they've evaluated a low-fat diet, rich in fruits and vegetables, or whole grains and beans or legumes, referred often to as a plant-based diet. Or they've measured the effect of vegetarian diets in men with prostate cancer. Some have included exercise or stress management. And we have called them a comprehensive lifestyle program. These studies show promising benefits on PSA as a marker or indicator of prostate cancer progression. More important consideration, giving consideration to what I laid out in the beginning about the importance of heart disease and the competing risk factors for health is that these lifestyle interventions, unlike the other studies I'll present, offer other health benefits. And these have included improved eating and exercise behaviors of men who followed the program improved well-being, weight loss where it was needed, and lower cholesterol or other markers of heart disease. 
taken together, these would be considered more impactful changes as part of the dietary intervention. And also, these studies tended to be longer in duration, as you'll see from some of the other studies that I compare it to. Soy foods um, have many anti-cancer properties and other health benefits. For example, it's known that cholesterol can be lowered with inclusion of soy-based foods in the diet. We also know that soy has been the most widely studied, and therefore we have the most data on this agent. Overall, the evidence is a bit mixed. Um, we do have some studies show, showing the inclusion of soy in the diet shows a modest benefit in lowering PSA. We also know that soy foods are safe, they're well tolerated, and the only complaints are really some mild gastrointestinal side effects. But there was a time when there was suspicion raised or concern that soy foods containing a plant estrogen may not be advised or healthy for men with prostate cancer, but there are, there are no issues identified. This is a chart to give you an idea of the types of research that I reviewed to make these conclusions. And there are six studies listed here that have used soy in various forms, usually a food-based form or a protein fraction from the food. They've been short duration. Many of them have relied on interventions that happen before treatment or in men who are awaiting treatment or on active surveillance where they would only be treated if they had a rise in their PSA. I also reviewed uh, another six additional studies that looked at soy in the form of supplements. These tended to be shorter term and focused on the period of time between diagnosis and treatment. At various levels, you'll see the milligram dosages these generally reflect one to two servings of soy foods per day, with the exception of the top, which was uh, a rather high dose compared to the others. And some of these starred um, with an asterisk means that they were evaluated in a combination with other agents or part of a dietary intervention. So oftentimes we may not know the single benefit, if there is any, from one agent. Rather, it's a cluster of agents used together. My recommendation for soy is really based on its overall health properties, um, overall health benefits, specifically for heart disease, and its modest effect in lowering PSA. My recommendation is to choose a variety of soy-based foods as part of a healthy diet, and to choose the high that it is a high-quality protein, and it's best used as a substitute for meat, meaning that as you are increasing soy in your diet, you would decrease the amount of meat you would eat based on it providing a substitute for high quality protein. It's also a good source of calcium when it's fortified. And whole soy foods are best because they have higher nutritional value over processed soy foods where some of the real soy is removed in that processing. The best sources that I would say is starting with the whole bean, such as soybeans themselves, roasted soy nuts and edamame, or foods that are made from some minimal processing or moderate processing to become soy beverages or tofu. I call those the first and second generation soy foods. Lycopene has also been well studied in prostate cancer, and it has shown a modest benefit. The compound has antioxidant properties, and it's naturally found in many common foods that are typically red in color. In particular, cooked tomato-based foods are a richest source of lycopene, and they also include a rich complex of nutrients and fiber that we don't see included in supplements. This is a, an example of the studies that I reviewed for this recommendation. Uh, again, the most popular type of population to study has been men awaiting treatment on surveillance or after um, a rise in PSA after treatment in this particular um, group of supplements. And you can see the dosage were between 4 milligrams and 30 milligrams, which is relevant when we look at the food sources in the next slides. And again, the asterisks indicate that many of these agents were studied together as combinations or as part of a dietary intervention. You can see here that it's very easy to get between 4 and 30 milligrams of lycopene per day by focusing on foods of a tomato-based origin and that are cooked tomatoes, like juice, sauce, paste, soups. Other red foods like watermelon, um, 
and pink and red grape, for example, is also a reasonable source of lycopene. And so just by having a serving of juice plus fruit, you could easily meet the range provided by supplements. Vitamin E is also another agent that has been studied in prostate cancer, but it's only been studied as part of multi-agents, and therefore it's difficult to assess whether vitamin E has any benefit on its own. Men are recommended to choose foods that are rich in vitamin E as part of a healthy diet. The recommended daily intake is actually only in the range of around 22 international units. And we've seen that vitamin E supplements in the dose of 400 IUs or greater have actually been associated with adverse effects related to heart disease. Some of you may have also heard about a large prevention study called the SELECT trial. In this study, they used vitamin E supplements along with selenium, but there was a vitamin E only arm of the study. And after long-term follow-up, they reported an unexpected increase in the development of prostate cancer with the 400 IU dose. And it's important to note that supplements are sold often in much higher doses compared to what the recommended daily intake is. And in the case of vitamin E, we see that 400 is approximately 20 times what's recommended. This is a chart of vitamin E content of common foods. You can see that supplements contain large amounts, but many nuts, seeds, and vegetable oils also provide small amounts, and when added together in the diet, can help reach the 22 international units or more that are needed. Selenium has been studied in men with prostate cancer, and a diet or a supplement providing up to 200 micrograms may be beneficial, but no more than 400 should be taken. It's recommended that you choose a variety of foods that are rich in selenium. Of interest, things like Brazil nuts um, are very loaded in selenium, and as many as only six or eight or a small handful of Brazil nuts can provide several hundred um, micrograms upwards toward four and 500. Selenium is actually not a shortage in food. It's included in many forms, such as meat, fish, poultry, and eggs, dairy products, and of course nuts. The recommended daily allowance is only 55, compared to much higher doses that have been used in clinical trials. My message to you is to let food be thy medicine, and the benefits of single nutrients and most dietary supplements have been overstated to the public in popular press and haven't been strongly supported by scientific evidence. And whole foods are the best source of nutrients because they provide phytonutrients that supplements lack and also fiber. I think one of the um, worst food trends recently is related to juicing um, and singular nutrients as a therapy for cancer or other diseases where we are processing juices and removing the pulp or the flesh of the plant, which is exactly where these phytonutrients are found. Some vitamin mineral supplements that have antioxidant properties have shown some harm, referring to the high-dose vitamin E and selenium. And also in men with prostate cancer, we caution supplements containing hormones as they may stimulate prostate cancer growth. Sorry, I clicked on a, a graphic, and uh, <laughs> it's taken me to the internet. All right, I mentioned on bone health, we know that because of the average age of prostate cancer being over 65 and the use of hormone therapy, that bone density can be compromised. Over time, bone loss can lead to osteoporosis, which is sometimes thought of as a woman's disease at menopause, but it's not. And in the condition of osteoporosis, bones become weaker and less dense, and the real concern is that there is a risk that a bone may fracture. And of course, there are several lifestyle factors that can promote bone health. Most often we think of calcium and vitamin D. And in this case, I'm demonstrating here the calcium and vitamin D content, sorry, uh, requirements in the diet plus supplements. So it's a total from all sources. Men under age 70 would be looking at 1,000 milligrams per day. And men over 71 years need 1,200 milligrams of calcium. And the recommended daily intake for vitamin D is actually 600 for men under 70 and 800 over age 71. I've also shown the upper limits for these nutrients, meaning that they are considered the upper tolerable limit after which people 
from the average population could be expected to experience some toxicity. You may have heard that there's many different vitamin D recommendations out there, and I've just listed four of the more common associations that have promoted vitamin D levels. And you'll see that almost all of them are higher than the recommended daily intake established on the previous slide. So most often the range is cited from the 400 to 600 up to 1 or 2,000 international units. The rationale most often provided is that supplementation of vitamin D is needed because vitamin D production in the skin is limited uh, in Canada and the northern latitude and also the use of sunscreen in summer months and also that there are a few foods that are naturally a rich source. In terms of natural sources, fish and to a lesser extent egg yolk is a source of vitamin D. And you can see the various levels. It's mostly, quote, fatty fish that would be providing a higher level of vitamin D in the diet. In the case of supplements, many supplements may provide four to 600 or up to 1,000 or more. There are additional foods that are fortified, meaning vitamin D is added. And these would include milk, where there's 100 IUs per cup, and also orange juice, plant beverages like soy and rice, as well as some breakfast cereals and margarine. Cheese and yogurt would not be a good source of vitamin D unless fortified milk was used. A lot of men ask me about vitamin D and whether or not it's good for preventing prostate cancer progression. And I call this a ray of hope because I've only identified one randomized controlled trial that has looked at vitamin D in men with prostate cancer. And in this study, they gave three different doses, which you can see are uh, quite a bit higher than the recommended daily intake. They gave this supplement for one month in a small group of men who are awaiting to be treated with surgery. Overall, they did not find a difference in PSA with the supplementation. But Creatively, they looked at combining the higher doses together compared to the lower dose, and there was a decrease in PSA values in that analysis. In all cases, despite the higher dose, vitamin D was well tolerated at each dose. I also identified two non-randomized trials which suggest some benefit of vi vitamin D, but this is difficult to determine when there are no control groups in the study design. And this was a Toronto-based study, the first one, and we are awaiting other studies to show us what the effect might be. In terms of a prostate cancer diet, we know that three organizations have put out cancer survivorship diet guidelines. What they share in common really is an emphasis on maintaining a healthy body weight, being physically active, and from a diet perspective, eating mostly plant-based foods with greater than five servings of fruits and vegetables, whole versus unpressed foods, processed foods, and a limitation put on red and processed meats. And this is looking across the board at the three main organi credible organizations who have given good diet guidelines. If we put it all together, I'm definitely in favor of emphasizing a plant-based diet using whole, minimally, or unprocessed foods, foods that are naturally high in fiber, which is found only in plants, fats that come from oils, nuts, seeds, and avocado, i.e. plant sources, an emphasis on dietary patterns versus individual foods and nutrients. Often I find that cancer survivors in general and also men with prostate cancer become very focused on a singular nutrient rather than an entire dietary pattern. It's sort of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts approach. And the top dietary patterns from a scientific perspective have been plant-based diets, something called a DASH diet, which I can elaborate on, but really is called abbreviation for dietary approaches to stop hypertension, or a Mediterranean-style diet. Really, the focus should be on nutrients from foods. They contain vitamins, minerals, fiber, as well as key phytonutrients that get overlooked that are not found in supplements. And of course, nutrients from foods do not have the adverse effects that can happen. Also emphasizing leaner meats and plant-based proteins, so reduction in red meat. Red meat is defined as beef pork and lamb, and an inclusion of greater amounts of fish in the diet if you're not already doing so, the recommendation would be twice per week, and then creatively using beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds as substitutes for meat. By using it as a substitute, you get the benefit of this plant food, and then you get a reduction of saturated fats from animal foods. The recommendation for alcohol would be to 
drink in moderation for those that choose to drink, and two drinks per day for men. I've included the women as one drink in case there's partners out there or interested parties on the line, and that this diet be adequate in calcium and vitamin D because of those bone health effects that I previously discussed, and to reduce other foods, to reduce empty calories associated with foods with excess fat, salt, and sugars. Oftentimes when I'm speaking to the public or patients, a lot of people will define their diet by what they're not including. So uh, for example, I'm on a low fat diet or I'm on a low calorie diet or I'm on a low sodium diet rather than defining what you're eating from the perspective of I have a diet rich in plant foods or rich in nutrients, rich in fiber. A heart healthy diet is a prostate healthy diet. I think you're pretty much getting the, the um, emphasis that I'm creating here. Um, if we look at 2013, there's new uh, cardiac guidelines available, and again, they do emphasize a dietary pattern similar to everything that I've just discussed, and adapting dietary patterns for other medical conditions that you might have and engaging in exercise. Normally, I would speak quite a bit about exercise, but I've had to confine my talk around diet. In summary, we know that PSA as a biomarker for cancer progression isn't perfect, but it does give us some indication that um, it can respond to interventions from diet and dietary supplements that could be important to the long-term management of prostate cancer. The most promising ones have been around lifestyle interventions. Soy and tomato-based foods have shown some benefit. Overweight and obesity is a concern that men with prostate cancer with higher BMIs have a higher risk of recurrence after treatment with either radical prostatectomy, i.e. surgery, or radiation therapy, and that cardiovascular disease is an important cause of death in men diagnosed with prostate cancer, and that it's modified by many of the same lifestyle factors. I did notice when I looked at a site called clinicaltrials.gov that there, with a quick search, I found over 165 trials that are registered that are using a diet or dietary supplement and or exercise intervention in a population of men with prostate cancer. So it's a very high area of active research. The studies in progress are looking at the following agents. Some are very similar to what I've presented and some new ones. Weight loss seems to be more of a theme in the newer studies coming, so looking at a reduction in calories for weight loss or different types of weight loss diets. There are many recommended resources for men and partners who want to learn more about this. The first one I've listed is a guide that I've written. It does need some updating, which I'm doing, and I'm in the process of doing. It's called a Nutrition Guide for Men with Prostate Cancer. Uh, another great one out of Ontario is the, from the Prostate Center. It's Challenging Prostate Cancer, Nutrition, Exercise, and You. Uh, there are also a number of fact sheets that are easy to read and packaged as two pages from the Men's Health Initiative here in British Columbia. And something new that's coming in the spring of this year is an androgen deprivation therapy essential guide for prostate cancer patients and their loved ones. And also, it is a companion guidebook that is used along with a program that I'm collaborating with in, um, called the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. Each of these have a website, and all of these resources are free downloads that you can access from the internet. At this point, I would like to thank you for your attention and participating today. And I know that there were some emailed questions and probably a, a lively section to follow on questions that I'm happy to answer. Great. Thank you, Sherry. So while uh, everyone has a chance to write in their questions, we're just going to do a, a quick poll. Uh, so the first question is, are you participating in this webinar as an individual? So we'll just give you a minute or two to answer that. Great. So it looks like we have uh, at least a few groups of people watching. So the next question is for those people who are watching with somebody else. Can you just let us know how many additional people you're watching the webinar with?
Great, thank you. So we'll move on to the questions uh, for Sherry. The first question is, many foods have phytochemical properties. Are the phytochemical chemicals equally effective in fighting all cancers, or are, they specific, are there specific ones for prostate cancer? Uh, this is an interesting question. So phytonutrients or phytochemicals, for those who don't know what they are, are compounds with various health properties or health-promoting properties that are found in the flesh of plants. And there are literally thousands of them. There are definitely some that are more active with different types of cancers. But in general, what we promote is that a diet loaded in fruits and vegetables would be providing an abundance of each of the types. So we have seen today where lycopene, which is a phytonutrient found in tomatoes, is specifically more active in prostate cancers than it would be in another cancer. But the best advice is to have brightly colored fruits and vegetables and a large variety of them. The deep, intense color of fruits and vegetables will tell you the concentration of these phytonutrients. So things like beets or red peppers or squash or pomegranate or blueberries, something with a deep, intense color would show you that they're particularly concentrated in those foods. Great, thank you. So the next question is, can you comment on pomegranate juice and any benefits it might have? Uh, to prostate cancer and just general overall health? So the question on pomegranate, pomegranate juice, um, there was quite a large interest um, that increased maybe three, four, maybe four or five years ago. And this was due to a lot of active agents or phytonutrients specifically in pomegranates and its juice. And in the beginning, the studies were mostly poorly conducted so they were non-randomized and they didn't have a control group and when they showed some benefit you're always suspicious about not having any data to compare it to beneficial compared to what and in terms of actual high quality studies there are none I see that there's sort of a resurgence of interest with the upcoming trials but the available evidence that we have so far um, did suggest a benefit but that it was confined to studies of poor quality. Because it's actually quite concentrated in sugars, the juice or any juice, um, I would recommend eating the pomegranate fruit instead of the juice, especially if you have diabetes or are um, watching calories or your sugar level. Great, thank you. Can you comment on how effective a vegan diet is or could be for someone who has metastasized prostate cancer? Men with metastatic prostate cancer, meaning that the cancer has moved from the original site of the prostate to other parts of the body, um, is, has not been well studied in nutrition. I, I do believe I'm only aware of one study that looked at men with metastatic disease um, in a higher quality design study. And unfortunately, we just do not have the data to make specific or conclusions or, or recommendations. In general, the vegan diet or a vegetarian diet can be very healthy if it's well planned. We certainly, as dietitians, know lots of examples where people are following vegetarian diets without many vegetables or legumes or beans. Um, so I, w I will say when it's well planned, we do feel that that's an effective diet for cancer prevention and also is part of guidelines for people living with cancer. I would say that overall my take on vegetarian diets are that, and there are many types, some that include dairy, for example, and some that don't. But in general, my belief from reading the literature is that the benefits of a vegetarian diet are really because they have an abundance of plant foods and not that they exclude meat. So basically what I'm saying is that you could have a diet that included some meats and dairy and eggs, but as long as it was loaded with plant foods or had the base of it planned around plant-based foods, that you could also get some of the benefits of a vegetarian diet. So I'm pro-vegetarian, but I also know that a lot of people may be really successful at eating a diet that's heavily based in plant foods, but that still contains some meat or dairy in it. Great. Um, so some reports suggest that not taking flax 
oil, yet John Hopkins recently indicated that flaxseed may, may be beneficial. What is your view? I'm aware of a couple of studies that have investigated flaxseed. In those studies, they were also used as a larger dietary intervention that combined low fat or other agents in it. So it's always hard to single out the, the, the one food if it's been studied as a group. Um, there have been some reports lately that have been conflicting around something called an omega-3 fatty acid, which is rich in flaxseed. And we've seen, like I said, some conflicting data at this point. From what I would say that I've on balance is that flaxseed or fish fats, which also contain omega-3 fatty acids, are healthy for men with prostate cancer. I'm not sold yet that supplements just identifying the fat and supplementing the fat um, that were there yet in terms of knowing the exact safety or benefit to them. So I would say that including flaxseed and grinding it so that the nutrients are available, including fish that is a rich source of omega-3, is a safe and beneficial thing to do, um, but not to use the supplements until we know a bit more information on their exact effects. Great. Um, the next question is, does alkaline or pH levels have any relation to cancer? This is a popular diet that many people are attracted to, an alkaline ash diet or a pH diet. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that could be said, but I, I will say that we don't have any high quality studies that have looked at it in people with cancer. I think that small amounts of data are perpetuated by citing the same limited amount of evidence um, or just claims, and that's perpetuated as evidence. But uh, we simply don't have it. I think whenever I've looked at the alkaline ash diet, certainly there weren't too many things that raised my eyebrow from a standpoint that this diet was unsafe or unhealthy. Uh, a lot of times it does include a variety of different types of fruits and vegetables, but restricts others. So I haven't understood completely the, the rhyme or reason or believed that you could change your alkaline balance from foods, but I don't think it's a particularly harmful approach. Great. The next question is in regards to garlic and if you have any thoughts on the benefits of eating a, a section of garlic every day. Um, garlic is a wonderful and probably underused spice for many people or, or component of the diet. And we cluster garlic with onions and broader into a category of vegetables that are sort of a gassy vegetables, uh, cruciferous vegetables, um, cauliflower, for example, Brussels sprouts. All of those are quite healthy. Eating up to a half uh, of a, a head of garlic really isn't a problem. There's a lot of debate about um, you know, crushing the garlic and when to crush it and cooked or uncooked. But in general, um, it's a very healthy addition to a diet. Great. So the next question is similar to that of the pomegranate juice question, um, but just in regards to has cranberry juice been proven to lower PSA? Uh, that's a great question. Um, cranberry juice may have gained some popularity in discussion with prostate cancer because for many years we've known that cranberry juice has properties that make the bacteria in our urinary tract a little more slippery and we eliminate them, meaning that the bacteria doesn't adhere and it's helpful in reducing the risk of um, urinary tract infections. And so sometimes that's equated with being related to prostate cancer in some way because men often have a number of different urinary symptoms at diagnosis or throughout treatment. But the cranberry juice specifically hasn't been tested as a therapy per se with prostate cancer, but just may be associated because of its benefits in um, lowering infection risk, which, which is something that is real in terms of there is evidence around that. Great. So the next question is, what is your take on carrot juice and broccoli? So my take on it, um, 
I'm wondering if that means more from a nutritional perspective um, rather than prostate cancer. I mentioned briefly that um, there is a, a great surge in popularity of juicing in general. And I'm not a fan, I'll say straight up, um, because most of the juicers available that I've seen in the consumer market tend to be ones that extract the pulp into a basket, which is loaded with these phytonutrients that we've spoken about. And it extracts, extracts the liquid, the sugar, um, the calories, and some of the nutrients. So in general, I'm not in favor of juicing because it eliminates the fiber and all of the phytonutrients that are in that pulp. And also, it often takes four, five, six pieces of fruit or vegetable to make a glass of juice. And therefore, that becomes a higher calorie, higher sugar amount because normally someone wouldn't sit down and peel and eat four or five oranges. Um, carrots, of course, uh, very healthy. Um, most vegetables are. Uh, my choice would be to have yourself find a way to incorporate them into your diet that we're using the whole food rather than just an extraction of the juice. I often say when we're looking at food, you can take an, an apple as an example. And you can have the apple. You can have a peeled apple. You can have applesauce, you can have apple juice, or maybe even apple flavored something. And every step in that line, you lose some type of nutritional value of the food. And so juicing is sort of three or four removed from the actual fruit. Great. Uh, the next question is from somebody who's been diagnosed with inoperable advanced disease and is in a clinical trial with hormone therapy. And they're trying to find out what to eat, drink, or what vitamins and supplements to take to avoid the flu. That's a pretty sophisticated question. Um, I probably want to know a little bit more about the gentleman. Um, I'm wondering if there might be a dietitian or someone closer to home as part of the clinical trial or clinic to help provide a bit more personalized advice. Um, there are two different services, in one in Ontario and one in BC where I am physically located. And they are an opportunity to phone in and speak to a registered dietitian in either of those provinces. Um, in BC, it's HealthLink BC. Uh, in Ontario, I believe it's Eat Right. Um, you could Google those phone numbers. Um, or if you're part of a cancer center, you could um, contact the dietitian or physician in charge of your care for a referral. In general terms, um, avoiding the flu is generally a larger topic of keeping your immune system healthy and, or fighting off any kind of infections. And um, being well nourished, um, not losing weight, um, having a healthy diet in general, giving your body all the nutrients that build the immune system but there's no specific individual nutrient that would be an immune enhancer or booster on its own. So I've sort of talked in general terms, but hopefully there's some information there that's helpful. Thank you. The next question is, does turmeric reduce the side effects of radiation therapy? And is it, is it a good overall thing to have when you have a prostate cancer diagnosis? I'm sorry, Catherine, was that turmeric? Yeah, turmeric. OK. Um, there's a lot of uh, attention paid to spices lately. Um, they are um, something that generally has not been associated with any adverse effects ever. And there's new interest in which herbs and spices may actually have antiviral activity or cancer prevention activity. Turmeric is one of them. Um, I see no reason why you can't combine it with treatment. Um, but there, there would be very few studies at this point. It would just be looking at properties of turmeric in test tubes and laboratory conditions, and not much in the way of actual clinical trials with people. But I think it's a new and upcoming area that we will find out much more in the future. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, in, the view of, in view of the recent report on Ontario prostate cancer patients that 4.5% of patients receiving radiation for prostate cancer will suffer from other cancers, so for example, rectum, bladder cancer, or blood cancer within five to nine years, how can diets improve the outcome of what foods and what foods should be consumed? 
That's an interesting perspective or question, and it sort of feeds into the perspective that I've taken for this webinar is that I'm promoting a diet that really affects many different health conditions or disease states. And the benefit of focusing your energy around whole unprocessed foods and a plant-based diet with leaner meat, legumes, beans, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, high fiber, that type of thing. This, the health benefits of an eating approach like that are wide reaching. They would be considered a cancer prevention diet or a good weight loss diet. It's good for heart disease. It's showing promise with reducing PSA in men with prostate cancer. The best evidence we have is for dietary patterns rather than singular nutrients. So I think if your attention were to refocus on the bigger picture of health, other types of cancers, other health risks that Western men are going to succumb to at some point, then it's the same dietary pattern. So I think it's good news if you're looking to say, well, I might be treated for prostate cancer, but I might have risks of other cancers or other health concerns. It is this type of dietary pattern exactly that I want to refocus your energy on. Great. The next question is, um, you mentioned that red meats aren't as good for uh, someone who has prostate cancer. What about white meat? Yeah, there is, you know, the debate about red versus white meat, and, you know, we make these generalizations. Um, white meat obviously appearing in white, um, you know, it would be poultry, turkey, um, sorry, chicken, turkey, poultry in general, uh, fish, and red meat being the beef, pork, and lamb, uh, meats that are red in color. The two different meats do have different properties. For example, red meat does have some higher nutritional value when it comes to things like iron, for example. And it's really to have a balance um, so that uh, meat is playing a smaller portion in the role of your diet overall. And rather than focusing on red meat, it's to have a selection of many different types of meat. And so they both can be included. It's just to take our focus in Western countries off the red meat because that seems to be um, where we tend to choose meat. And the other problem with red meat is that there is a large number of processed meats that tend to start from beef, pork, or lamb, for example, bacon, sausage, deli meats. Um, and there's less of those that come from white meats in general. So they're both healthy. You just want to keep portions smaller um, as part of a plant-based diet, and you want to focus on the meats in general that are the flesh of the animal versus a processed product that has maybe additional fats or sodium or nitrates added that are less healthy. Great. Uh, so unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I'll, I'll ask just one last question. And this is from somebody who has had a radical prostatectomy and has gained 10 or 15 pounds after the surgery. Does this increase his risk of recurrence, even though he's still within his uh, BMI, his normal BMI? That's a great question. And, and um, from what I've read, I understand that it's only the weight above, extending beyond the healthy weight range categories that are uh, an issue. So if this gentleman um, was a healthy weight prior to prostate cancer, had some surgery, has gained to 10, 15 pounds, but still finds himself within the healthy weight category. That's a very good sign. Um, aesthetically, if you want to lose the weight, that can be healthy too when it's done with healthy eating and exercise. Um, so I wouldn't worry if you're still within the healthy weight range. Great, thank you. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Sherry and all of the participants for coming together tonight to discuss diet and prostate cancer. I would also like to take this opportunity to highlight a new service that Prostate Cancer Canada has la launched in the past few months. It's the Prostate Cancer Information Service, which is a collaboration with the Canadian Cancer Society and provides information and support throughout the cancer journey over the phone and through email. And the service is offered in a number of languages and all conversations are kept confidential. I'd also like to note that our next webinar is on February 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's, a, again, a Tuesday. And the guest speaker will be Dr. Danny Vesprini, who will be discussing active surveillance. So thanks again to Sherry for uh, coming on to our webinar series tonight to discuss diet and prostate cancer.
Thank you.